Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. The last time we were together, we shared with you on the subject of understanding the fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord, the first four, exactly on the day of their occurrence and the how Jesus will fulfill the Feast of Trumpets on the last, on exact day when he comes and brings forth the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. Tonight we're going to talk about another aspect regarding that, and that is what happens to the, in the church at the time of this Feast of Trumpets. There is a work going on in the church at the same time as the, for get ready for the end time fulfillment of the work of God in the church. And we see, we'll see that tonight. In Leviticus 23, verse 24, speaking of the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. So this is the time of trumpets. It's interesting, as we talked about the three feast seasons, Passover, and weeks, or Pentecost, and then tabernacles. They really correspond to the days of creation. The first day of creation was when light came. And Jesus is the light that came in the first month to bring forth the redemption. The third day was when there was fruitfulness that came into the earth. And Pentecost, which is the third month, but that's the second season, is when now there was a replanting of the earth with now new fruitfulness, the new creation, the people that were born again, who were alive, on, could be alive on earth and be born again, new believers. And the seventh day is Tishri. That's the time when after God had finished his work, he rested. Well, that's the finished work. It's going to bring in the harvest, and then it's going to bring forth the rest, the period of rest in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, when he is going to be ruling and reigning uh, for a thousand years. Well, we talk, we're talking about trumpets, and trumpets is the one that happens on the first day of the seventh month. It's interesting that there's only one of the feasts that happen on the first day of the month, and that is this particular one, the Feast of Trumpets. And when we talk about this, this, when is the first day of the month on the Hebrew or on the lunar calendar? It's when you see the first sliver of the new moon. Well, you don't know when that is. You don't know the hour or the day when that is. Well, that's what we see in the scripture, talking about how you don't know the hour or the day when he's going to come back, because it's referring to the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. Now, prior to this seventh month is the month on the Hebrew calendar called Elul. It is known as the month of repentance. And this particular period is the time when they were to repent, they were to confess their sins, they were to turn. And this points to as we are getting ready for the coming of the Lord, we have to be sure that we have confessed our sins, we have repented, we have turned away from walking contrary to the way of the Lord, and we are following after Him, so we are ready for the coming of the Lord. We also say, see this time in 1 Kings chapter 8, over in verse 2, where it speaks all the men assembled themselves to unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month. This name Ethanim was the name of it prior to the time when they went into the captivity in Babylon for the 70 years. After that, then the name became Tishri. This word means permanent streams flowing. Streams flowing. And this speaks of what is to happen in the end time church because they're, they're not going to be in captivity like they were in Babylon. <coughs> Instead, we're coming out of captivity. And prior to that, then, we see the permanent streams were flowing before they went into captivity. Well, as we come out of captivity, that's again what God will bring forth in this glorious, perfected church that he's going to raise up. In John chapter 7, we see it over here when it talks about at the last great day of the feast, this is in the seventh month, he said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. 
And this he, he said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Well, that's like perennial streams flowing continually. The living water is coming into us and it's going to flow out of us. And we see that this is what is going to happen in this mighty end time church. It's going to be powerful and, and seeing the power of God and the work of God be accomplished through the end time church. Well, the seventh month, speaks of the completing of the dealings that God had with the people of Israel. But it also has a spiritual type to it of completing his work in the church up to the second coming of Jesus Christ, as we see. And this also, the time of trumpets, is Yom Tiriah. Yom means day. Tiriah refers to the uh, shofar the sounding of the shofar. And it was known as the day of the shounding, sounding of the shofar and also the day of the awakening blast because the sound of the shofar, which is the last trump, that's going to sound. And then what's going to happen? There's going to be an awakening. The dead in Christ shall rise and you and I, which are alive, are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and we get glorified bodies at that time. We also see that this time is the time where it's the end of this harvest season. We see in Exodus 23, verse 16, where it speaks of the Feast of Harvest, the fruit fruits of first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the Feast of Ingathering. This is the ingathering, or the harvest, which is at the end of the year. Well, that's what's going to happen, the ingathering of all the harvest of souls that are going to happen and all the, the things, the fruit, the things that have been accomplished and our labors ourselves as we're, all of our works are then going to be looked at by the Lord as he passes out the rewards and, and we're for us to be set in our place in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So this is the feast of ungathering of not only souls but also the harvest of all of our works. We see over in Ezra and we talk about this seventh month and the things that are going to happen in the end time church. In Ezra chapter 3, whenever you see something about the seventh month that has some prophetic revelation pointing towards the work in the end time church. Ezra chapter 3 verse 1, when the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. There's going to be a coming of the remnant that is going to rise up and walk in the ways of the Lord is going to become one. Jesus prayed that this church would become as one, and it will become as one in one accord. And this is, they came to the place of being like one man to Jerusalem. And we see over in verse 6, that from the first day of the seventh month, and that's the time of Tishri, of trumpets as well, when we see this is all pointing towards the work being done in the church. On the first day of the seventh month, when they began to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord, they were offering sacrifices, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. Well, if you and I are going to see the end time work be done, the foundation has to be laid in us, because you and I are the temple of the Lord. How does the foundation get laid? Through the word of God that we hear and do in our life. So we come to verse 8. And here he says, in the second year of their coming in the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month, being began Zerubbabel, the son of Jetiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and Levites, and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem, appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. <clears throat> Notice, in order to be able to set forward this work, they had to come out of captivity. You and I must come out of all captivity. That means we must conquer all sin. We must cast out all the devils. We must get free from every bondage. And that is the work that God is doing in the end time church to set us free, to bring us out of all captivity in our life. And as they came out of it, they set forward the work of the house of the Lord. And of course, how's that going to happen in us? By hearing and doing the word in our life. So they set forward this work that was going to be accomplished. And then verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets. 
and Levites, and sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, the king of Israel. Notice, here's when they laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. Well, that points out as this work is being set forth in our life, and we are hearing and doing the word, you're going to get the foundation laid. God wants the foundation laid so you are established in the things of God. And notice, then these guys, they were praising and worshiping God. They were set as priests in their apparel. <clears throat> they had been clothed. You and I are going to be clothed <clears throat> with the Lord Jesus Christ and clothed with the garments of God and be praising and worshiping Him and come to the place of uh, being in the very presence of God for Him to manifest Himself mightily. We see over in verse 11, they sang together by course and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord for His good. For his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. When the foundation has been laid in your life, because you're a hearer and a doer of the word, where the enemies will not even be able to have any effect against you, remember the storms will not even be able to shake you, you're going to be praising and rejoicing as well because you have become strong, you have been established in the things of God, and you have come out of captivity and conquered the enemies. That doesn't mean the enemies aren't going to stop working against you, though. They're going to try. We see what happened in Ezra chapter 4, verse 1, when the adversaries of Jude and Benjamin heard the children of captivity build the temple unto the Lord God of Israel. This is we build that work. We're building our spiritual house in our own life. Well, they came to Zerubbabel, the chief of the fathers, and said to him, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. Now the devil will try to deceive you by bringing false things into your life to make you think that, oh, this, you should take this along. Oh, it's, you can't have any false things. It'll start contaminating you and damaging you. And they were, they were saying, they seek their law, your God, and as we do, yeah, they're lying. And we do sacrifice unto him. No, they weren't doing any sacrifice. They were lying and deceiving. You have to understand the enemy will try to deceive you away from the truth. He'll try to bring some false doctrine in, try to bring false prophecy, false teaching, any kind of thing to get you off track, anything to stop the work of God from going on in your life. Well, these guys were wise at this point. They, Zerubbabel, Yeshua, Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. That's what you need to do. You need to shut the door on anything that the enemy brings against you that's trying to hinder the building of the house of God in your life. You must be ready to watch and pray, not enter into temptations. Be ready to resist everything that would come at you. Be sure you check everything out in line with the word of God so you don't get deceived by the enemy. Verse 4. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in the building. Well, they were finally able to break through. If you let the enemy have place and get you off track of walking in the ways of the Lord and being consistent, he can weaken you. Don't let yourself get weakened. Don't let yourself get troubled in the building of the things of God. You and I are to be diligent in seeing this work be accomplished. Well, this is what the devil tries to do, and he'll try to hinder the, the work. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. God will try to, of course, the devil will try to work to frustrate the purposes of God, but you've got to be on top of things. Always be thinking what the Word says. Always be ready to resist the enemies. Be praying. Be in the Spirit. Don't let yourself get in the flesh. Stay away from the things of this world. Make sure that you're guarding yourself so the enemies are not able to frustrate the purposes of God in your life. Well, they were successful, unfortunately, and look what the result was down in verse 24. Then ceased the work of the house of God. It got stopped. In fact, it has got ceased for a long time. God doesn't want you ever to let the work of God be ceased in your life. You keep doing what He says. You keep in the Word, hearing the Word, doing the Word, praying the Word, speaking the Word, keeping your faith applied, casting out the demons, doing the things of God, growing in all areas of your life. Well, we come to chapter 5, verse 1. Then the prophets, and remember how did God deal with things in the Old Testament? He spoke through the prophets his word. So the word would come through these prophets. The Gehi the prophet, Zechariah the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Jude and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. So they spoke the word unto them. 
And then they rose up and they began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. Now, what does that tell you? When you hear the word, it'll get you back on track. If you get away from the word, you'll be off track. Make sure you're hearing the word. And that the word came to them from these ones. And then the prophets of God were helping them because they would keep speaking the word of God. You need to keep hearing the word of God. And the word in the New Testament, of course, it's Jesus now. He's speaking to us through the word in the New Testament. That's why hearing the word continually is important if you are going to develop and grow and become strong and mighty in the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 7. We see the same thing brought forth as far as the, the need for the word. Nehemiah 7, 73. Here's where the priests, Levites, porters, singers, some of the people, and Nethanims, and all Israel dwelt in their cities when the seventh month came. You see, the seventh month is speaking of something prophetically about this work in the end-time church. Children of Israel were in their cities. So all the people gathered themselves together as one man again. Here's this one man. Into the street was before the water gate. And they speak unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. They wanted to hear the word of God. The ones who are really right with God and are going to be a part of this remnant are going to be the ones that want to hear the word of God. As it seems like a lot of people don't want to hear the Word of God today. They just they want their ear tickled, or they want them, someone to tell them jokes, and they want someone to entertain them, and all these kind of things. No. We need to hear the Word of God. They wanted to hear it. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both the men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. Revelation, again, of what's going to happen in the end-time church first day of the seventh month, they wanted to hear the Word of God. They wanted to get understanding. You should have a strong desire to get in the Word, hear the Word, gain spiritual understanding, be a doer of that Word, and grow up. And not just hear a little bit here and there. Look what these guys did. Verse 3, He read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning, and this is the time from the light of day or dawn, daybreak, That'd be like six in the morning. Until midday, that was like noon. Well, that's six hours. We want to hear the word. They didn't want to just hear a little bit. They wanted to hear it for six hours, hearing the word. The more you pour the word in you and you get the knowledge of God and the revelation is coming to you, and you're going to grow in the things they want to get understanding, meaning implying the fact that they were going to take hold of it and do what the word says. That is what God wants for you in your life. Well, these people, they were after the word, for sure. Ezra, which means help. The scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they'd made for the purpose. And then it talks about these other ones. Interesting, their names actually bring some revelation of things. This one here. He was a gift of Jehovah. He was the one that was like a gift. And what does God have? He has gifts. His apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers that are going to teach the word of God for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. And Shema, which means hear. People that were really wanting to hear the word of God and are going to have ears to hear. And Aniah, Jehovah has answered. Here are those that are going to pray the word. They're going to get the answers. God's going to answer their prayers as they're putting the word in operation in their life. Urijah, here Jehovah is my light or my flame, this speaks of. Well, this speaks of revelation. He's going to bring revelation to us. Light is going to open our eyes and bring revelation knowledge of his ways. Hilkiah, my portion is Jehovah meaning that the portion that God is totally all I want. He is what I want. He is my portion. You want to know the true and living God, and you're going to press in to develop a personal, intimate fellowship with Him. And then Messiah, the work of Jehovah, speaks of the work of God being done in your life as you are in the Word, hearing the Word, and doing the Word. That was on the right hand. And on the left hand, here we see Padiah, and this is one means Jehovah's redeemed, ransomed, referring to the fact that his, he redeemed us. We get revelation that we're redeemed, we're purchased possession, we belong to him, and we come to the place of being yielded totally to him and letting him have his way since we're bought with a price and we're not our own. And then Mishael, who is what God is. Here it speaks of the fact that he is revealing himself, who he is, 
We get a revelation of him, revelation of who, how he operates, revelation of his character, revelation of all the things that he'll accomplish for you in your life. Malchiah, my king is Jehovah, it's referring to the fact that now he's coming to rule and reign in your life. He, you're a king, but he's going to come. If he's your king, you're going to let him rule and reign and have his way in your life and accomplish everything, including, you know, the kingdom comes when the demons are cast out and he sets you free from bondages. He comes to the next one, Hashem, which is rich. This riches of Christ, we're not talking about financial, we're talking about the riches of Christ, all the things that he wants to bring forth in your life. And then Hashbadara, which means the considerate judge. He is the one who is the considerate judge. He will be, of course, judging us. And he'll, of course, be pointing us to come to repentance, calling us to repentance if there's areas in our life that aren't right. Zechariah, Jehovah remembers. And he remembers all the things that you are doing, and he will bring blessings to you for the things that you are carrying out consistently in your life. And Meshulam, friend. What happens is we walk in the ways of the Lord, and we know Him, and we're following Him, we get revelation, all these things. We become the friend of God. Who is the friend of God? The one who keeps His commandments and walks in the ways of the Lord. This is going to be the result of the Word in you. It's going to change you. It's going to bring revelation to you. It's going to bring you to the place of knowing Him and walking in the way. Well, Ezra opened the book on the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Notice they stood up when the word was going to be opened. That's why I have you stand when we pray. It's a scriptural thing. We're honoring the word of God, because the word of God is the truth, and we're ready to receive that word to be written in our heart and written in our mind. And these people also, they blessed the Lord, the great God. All the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up of their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord. Ezra was speaking these blessings to the Lord, and they were worshiping Him. We're going to be worshipers. God wants you to be a praiser and a worshiper of the Lord. And down in verse 8, it says, So they read in the book of the law distinctly, that means clearly, gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And that's what we must have. We must have distinct, clear bringing forth of the Word of God so you can get understanding. Not just, you know, just throwing out a scripture and then just rambling on. No, we're going to tell you exactly what it says clearly. Make sure we see everything. Look at tense voice mood. Bring out meanings of words so we clearly, distinctly are able to distinguish and see exactly what the Word of God says. That is what He's going to do in those who are going to be a part of this end time glorious church in the fulfillment of the feast of, of uh, the feast of trumpets work in the end time church we go over to first kings chapter 7 now in verse 51 here's so it was ended all the work that king solomon made for the house of the lord brought in all these things that were dedicated, the treasures in the house of the Lord. That refers to the work being done and accomplished in us. And so Solomon assembled the elders of, of Israel and all the heads of the, the tribes and brought them in. They brought in the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David. What was the Ark of the Covenant? That was where the manifest presence of God would be. So now, this speaks of this manifest presence of God coming forth. And here, remember, this is speaking in the month Ithanim, which is where the permanent streams were flowing. Well, when the presence of God comes into you and the words in you, those streams of living water are going to flow out of us. And these guys came to the place where they were offering up tremendous sacrifices. It even says, King Solomon, all the congregation of Israel that were assembled into him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen, could not be told nor numbered for multitude. Well, we don't offer up animal sacrifices, but what do we offer up? Spiritual sacrifices of all kinds of praise to worship to, worship to God, also administering to other people. Un otherwise, untold numbers. That means you're going to be a sacrifice. You're going to be a living sacrifice. You're going to be a vessel for God to flow through in ministering not only to Him, but also in ministering to others. In verse 8, they drew out the staves. The end of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle, and they were not seen without. There they are unto this day. What's that mean? The staves are what went into the, the, whole, the ark that they carried it around from place to place. Well, pulling them out 
that meant the ark wasn't going to be moving anymore. And that speaks of the fact that the presence of God has come to dwell in us and manifest in us, and it's not going to be moving or leaving or going somewhere else. And what was in the ark? Look at it in verse 9. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone. What was that? That was the Word of God. That means what's supposed to be in you. Nothing but the Word of God. You get rid of all the other garbage. Everything that's not of Him, you don't want it in you. You want the Word in you because that's going to make you like Jesus. That's going to change you. That's going to bring forth fruit. It's going to bring forth promises. It's going to bring forth revelation of His ways. You're going to have the Lord Jesus Christ put on. And so here they had the Word in them. And look what happened. Now these guys, the work was finished in the house. Uh, we see the manifest presence of God. We see that the ark's presence now, when the word is in them, what happens next? It came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Well, what does this mean? The priests couldn't stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. When you meet all these conditions, the glory of God's going to fill the end time church. It's going to be powerful. The glory of God is going to manifest greatly. Now over in Chronicles, we see the same account, but we see a couple other things. Again, chapter 5, verse 1, this, this work was finished and accomplished. Verse 2, they were bringing up the Ark of the Covenant again, just like we see. And we see that, uh, come down to verse 9, we see the staves of the ark were taken out again. Same thing. This is the exact same thing. But now we come to verse 11. It says, It came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified. That means you and I come to the place of seeing the sanctification work accomplished in our life. We become holy before him. Did not then wait by course. The Levites, the singers, all them Vasaph, of Hetham, of Jejuthun, with the sons and brethren, being arrayed in white linen. What's that? That's the righteousness, remember. So that means we come to the place of being sanctified and holy, and we are clothed in the white linen, which is the righteousness. Having the cymbals, psalteries, harp, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Trumpets. Now oh, that's speaking of something. Of course, because we're talking about the fulfillment of the work in the church and Feast of Trumpets. Notice, 120 priests. 120 is the number of the change of an age. Remember how many were in the upper room? 120. Change from the Old Testament to the New Testament age. This is now 120 priests at the change of the New Testament age to the what? To the millennial age of Jesus Christ. This is speaking of those who are at the end of the time who have come to this place. They're arrayed in the white linen. They've come holy and dedicated and consecrated unto the Lord. In verse 13, it came to pass as the trumpet and singers were as one. We become one again to make one sound and heard and praising and thanking the Lord. They lifted up their voice with the trumpets, cymbals, instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For his good, for his mercy endures forever. Then the house was filled with a cloud. Same thing. We're going to see the glory manifest in the end time church, the house of the Lord. The priests could not stand ministered by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. As you get the word in you, and that's all you got in you, and you become holy, and you become righteous, and you become one, and you're a praiser and a worshiper of God, and you come to the place where you're following the Lord's sacrifices, you're just a sacrifice in everything you do, you're, walk, you're living for the Lord, essentially. The glory of God is going to fill that end-time church, and it's going to be powerful. Now, we talked also, we need to bring up about the fact that at the same time, remember the false prophets and the false teachers that are coming forth in the last days? Uh, they're going to be in trouble, and they're going to be dealt with. You've got to make sure you're not following anything, but you have to realize that those false ones are going to be dealt with. In Jeremiah 28, we see something. It came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azar the prophet, 
which was of Gib Gibeon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and of all the people. Here's a prophet coming to speak, and he's going to say something. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I've broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Well, was that true at that time? No, they were going to be going into captivity into Babylon. He's saying the opposite of what was going to happen. Jeremiah had already prophesied that they were going to go into captivity for 70 years, and they did. And this guy, before this has happened, is prophesying, saying, I've broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. And he, this is what he says. He says, within two years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house. Otherwise, two years, you're coming out of all this because I've broken his ban. It wasn't so. It was going to be 70 years they were going to be there. He was speaking wrong things. Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of the priests, in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord, Jeremiah is confronting him now. Even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen, the Lord do so. The Lord perform thy words which thou hast prophesied to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that's carried away captive from Babylon its place. He's agreeing on that part. Nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and the ears of all the people. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. The prophet that prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then that shall that prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. The prophets that have been before me, you know, they, they spoke of these things, he says. He said, this truly sent him. And then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck, and he brake it. And he spake, spake in the presence of the people, saying, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two years. And so then Jeremiah went his way as he said this stuff. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet after the Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke off the neck of the prophet. Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him, and I have given him the beasts of the field also. Then said the prophet Jeremiah to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. False prophets will make people trust in a lie. False teachers will make them trust in a lie as well all these false doctrinal teachings that are out there which are wrong. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year you shall die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. And look at the next verse. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year, when? In the seventh month. That is prophetic, meaning the false prophets and the false teachers, they're going to die. They're going to be taken out. They're going to be taken down. We've seen that happen. We've seen prophets that prophesied, and they're dead. We've seen people that have spoke things and taught things that are contrary to the Word of God, and they're dead. There'll be more if they do not come to the place of repentance. They cannot be speaking these things and think that they are going to live. No, God's going to take care of these false prophets and these false teachers. They're not going to get away with it. They're, they're going to be dealt with. We also see another thing. We cannot be in compromise. If we're in compromise, we're in trouble. 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 25, shows us something else. It came to pass on the seventh month. When we see the seventh month, you immediately think, ah, this is something happening for the end time as the end time church right before uh, when all these things are going to be happening for the end time church getting ready for the coming of the Lord. This Ishmael, the son of this one, Nethaniah, the son of Elishema, of the seed royal, came and ten men with him and smote Gedaliah that he died. He killed him. And the Jews and the Chaldees were with him at Mizpah. Oh, this guy, why did this happen to him? Well, we go back to verse 22. 
As for the people that remain in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, left, even over them he made Gedaliah, the son of Anakim, the son of Shaphan, the ruler. He made him the ruler. So he was ruling over the people there while he was, still, uh, while he was in, in this place. And so we come to verse 24. And Gedaliah said, swore to them and to their men and said to them, Fear not to be the servants of the Chaldees, that's the Babylonians, Dwell in the land, serve the king of Babylon, it shall be well with you. Is that what God would want us to do? No, that's a place of captivity for their punishment. Does he want us to dwell in their land and serve him and everything will be well with us by serving the enemy? No, that was a mistake. That was compromise, that was speaking contrary to the word of God. And what happened? He got killed. The ones that speak contrary to the true word of what's right and are willing to compromise, thinking that it's going to be well with you if you just submit to the Babylonian ways. And Babylon speaks of that which is contrary to God's ways, remember? Well, what are we told to do? We can't submit to Babylon's evil ways whatsoever. No. What does God tell us to do? He talks about when Babylon the Great has fallen. He speaks here in verse 4. He says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins and receive not her plagues. You don't submit to the ways of Babylon and the lawlessness and the false ways and the Antichrist message and law, all this unrighteous ways. No, sinful ways. Otherwise, you'll end up receiving of the judgments, the plagues that are going to come upon her. This guy was telling him to go ahead and submit to him, and he got killed. And we have to take an uncompromised stand, otherwise you're not going to be protected. There's also more about the significance of the blowing of trumpets. We see over in Genesis, remember when Abraham brought his son up and he had the knife up, he was ready to, to kill him and sacrifice him as he told him he was going to go up and offer him as a sacrifice, his son, Isaac. He said in verse 20, 12, this is when he was ready, in verse, uh, back here in verse 10, he was, took the knife, ready to slay his son. And the angel said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God seeing that it's not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and behold, looked and behold behind him a ram, a ram that was caught in a thicket by his horns. And he went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Well, the ram's horn is the shofar. And what was being offered, what were they blowing? They were blowing the shofar why did they blow the shofar all the time? Because it was a memorial of the ram sacrificed in the place of Isaac instead. And of course, it's a type of Jesus being sacrificed for us. So trumpets is a memorial of what Jesus accomplished for us in being sacrificed to accomplish the redemption for us. This blowing of the trumpets. Of course, what's going to happen when the, the, the last trump comes? Well, Jesus wasn't just the one who sacrificed to accomplish our redemption. What's the final part of the redemption he brings? The redemption of the body, which is what? Getting a glorified body. And what's going to happen at the Feast of Trumpets? We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and our redemption draweth nigh, as it says in Luke, with bringing us the glorified body, and we get glorified bodies. Praise God when that last trump sounds. We also see in 1 Kings, trumpets was declared and sounded when there was the coronation of the kings. 1 Kings 134, let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him their king over Israel and blow you the trumpet and say, God save King Solomon. Whenever they were anointing one, and raising him up to be the king, the ruler, they would blow the trumpet to coronate him as the king. And this was all done at this time, at the first uh, seventh month, first day, there they would do these things. That's when the kings became rulers on Tishri 1. Well, we see the fact that 
This is speaking here. He appointed him ruler over Israel. Well, you and I are kings, remember? And we are going to, what happens when we get caught up to meet the Lord in the air? We go up to heaven. <clears throat> we're going to be in the marriage supper with him. And we're going to be given our position of rulership in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We're kings and priests now, but we're going to be given that position, remember. If you've been faithful in many things, then you'll be ruler over, uh, faithful in few things, you'll be ruler over many things, as the scripture says. So our rulership is going to be appointed at that point in time. We also see over in Numbers that this was also calling the people to assemble together. There were different trumpets. There was not only the, the trumpets that were the shofar, the ram's horn, but there was also the silver trumpets. Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece that thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the adjourning of their camps. He would call them to assemble. Trumpets is calling the body of Christ to come to the place of being one and come to the place of assembling before the Lord to hear the word of God, all the things that we've already seen, to come to the place of being holy and righteous, to become mighty, to become a part of this glorified church that is going to be raised up. And also, it's a call to war because as you and I are seeing this work done, we're going to have to war, good warfare, and fight a good fight and conquer every enemy in our life. Because the enemy, remember, will try to hinder you. In Numbers 10.9, if you go to war on your land against the enemy that oppresses you, you blow an alarm with the trumpets. And you'll be remembered before the Lord your God. You'll be saved from your enemies. Trumpet speaks of us entering into the warfare to see God deliver us from all of our enemies and to see us be set free. And God, you're going to have to fight the good fight of faith and war, good warfare. If you're going to see the work of God done, you've got to conquer all the enemies in your life. Trumpets was a call to go to war. We see this many times. Jeremiah 31, verse 6. Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe. Them and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest to the war, were the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. The trumpets declaring they were going forth in war. We see over in Judges, the trumpet was the call to war. We see it Judges 3, 27, came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before them. And he said, follow after me. The Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hands. So they went after him and took here and uh, followed over. They slew Moab at that time, 10,000 men, all lusty, all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. They, gained, they got in the war, and they conquered them all as the trumpet sound was given. How about with Gideon? We see Gideon have the, the 300. We see the end result of all the things that God was dealing with. Gideon, the mighty man to carry, to deliver him from the Midianites. Judges 7.22, with 300 blew the trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow throughout all the host. And they ended up smiting all of the Midianites and defeated them. The trumpets is a call to war because you and I have to war a good warfare. We've got to engage in spiritual warfare if you're going to conquer the enemies and see the victory come forth in your life. Trumpets was also call the people, remember, to come to the place of being holy and being right before them. That meant they had to deal with all their sin. Well, we see this pointed out in Jeremiah 58.1. Cry aloud. Spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Lift up the voice like a trumpet was to point out all the areas where they need to deal with in their life. Well, God wants to, he's going to put his finger on everything in our life that's not of him. All sins, all transgressions, everything has to be dealt with. So you and I come to the place of being holy before the Lord. We see this again with a trumpet in Hosea 8. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord. Why? Because they've transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Otherwise, it's the warning of judgment. The judgment's going to come because of their sin. They haven't been walking according to the word of God. 
Israel, type of the church, and they'll cry to me, my God, we know thee. They think they should be okay. No, you gotta deal with all your sin. It's got to ha happen or the enemy's gonna get to you. Israel's cast off the thing that's good, the enemy shall pursue him. What was the thing that God cast off? The word. They didn't walk in the word anymore. They were walking in sin. They were transgressing, remember? They were now walking, transgressing the covenant against the law. Well, judgment's going to come. Otherwise, the trumpet is warning them of the judgment that is going to come against them if they don't come to the place of repentance. Another thing, remember that he's going to come back from a holy church and the judgment is coming to the church first. There's another aspect of trumpets is the judgment, the warning of the judgment that's coming. Ezekiel 33. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of my people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blows the trumpet and warns the people. The trumpet is warning the people. It's the, war the trumpet is being blown. So this speaks of the warning of the people of what is about to come, because we're coming down these last days. The judgment is coming to the church first, and then it is going to come to the world. Whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Ah, people, they got to take heed to the warning that's coming forth. If the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, you got to be a watchman. I'm a watchman blowing the trumpet for everybody. The judgment's coming. You got to be holy, you got to be right. Blow not the trumpet, the people not be warned, if we wouldn't talk about any of these kind of things. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he's taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Uh, people that don't want to talk about these kind of things in these days, they're making a mistake. We've got to warn everybody. We've got to tell them the truth about what is happening and what is about to come and getting everybody prepared for the things that are going to be coming. O thou son of man, I've set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel, therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. All of us need to be watchmen. I'm a watchman unto you and everybody hearing that's proclaiming these things. We need to be watchmen to others, all of us, to proclaim the truth to them, to call them to repentance, to call them to deal with all their sins and transgressions, to get right, because judgment is on the horizon and Jesus is going to be coming, and we must be right before the Lord, and we must be prepared. We got to be prepared for the things that are coming. We see another scripture over in 1 Corinthians 14. In verse 8, in the midst here, it speaks, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who should prepare himself to the battle? They won't. Well, the trumpet is someone sounding a sound speaking for them. And he's got to have uncertain. This means an indistinct, not a certain sound. That's why we got to be clear, straightforward, tell it like it is, leave nothing out, make sure it's accurate and right. Who shall prepare himself for the battle? We got to be prepared. We got to be prepared for the fight, ready to overcome, ready to come through the days that are going to be ahead so we can conquer and overcome and be victorious. That's what has to happen. Isaiah, chapter 18, verse 3. All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see ye, when you lift up an ensign on the mountains, someone's getting your attention, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. We got to hear. We gotta be ready to listen and hear what's coming. You know, think about it. When we just got we just finished that sometime recently about the judgments coming to the church. But think about to each one of those churches what was said at the end. He that hath an ear, 
let them hear. This is actually not, it's, it's actually a commanding statement. Every one of these are imperative mood. He that has an ear, hear what's being said. Because it's all about the judgment coming. He knows your works. You got to be right. If you're not right, your candlestick might get removed. You might get, like Jezebel, tossed in the great tribulation. You know, these kind of things. You have to make sure you're, we're ready and right. Of course, the ones that walk in his ways are going to be kept and protected in the days to come. We know judgment is coming, so we must hear. It's also interesting what it shows even in Revelation about sounds as a, tr a voice like a trumpet. Revelation 1.10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, John the re wrote this of course, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And what was, what, what was he telling him he was supposed to do? The trumpet's gonna give a warning, isn't he? He's gonna give a warning and tell them that judgment is coming. And what does he say? He says, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What you see is write in a book and send it to the seven churches that are in age. Send it to them all about the judgment that's coming to the church if they don't get right and they need to overcome and they need to get themselves right. The trumpet speaks of a judgment. In chapter four, in verse one, after the judgment was done in chapter two and three, look what it says. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, and said to me, Come up hither, and I'll show you things which must be hereafter. They have to happen. See, the judgment's got to come, because the judgment's going to come, because all those seals that are open for the title deed to take back the earth, they're all telling you all the judgments that are going to happen as Jesus takes back control of the earth to rule and reign. The judgments have to happen. And we see, what's he see? He's in the spirit. He sees a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He sat on those was to look like a jasper and sardine stone, a rainbow round about the throne, and his sight was like an emerald. So he sees him. And then what? Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment. Those are the, the ones who have already gone on to be with the Lord, the, the saints that are dead in Christ that are up there. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. They've already got, their, they get crowns given to them. And what else does he see? Out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunderings and voices. What are the lightnings and thunderings? Those are the judgments that are going to be being released. Otherwise, he took them up there to show them that the judgments are about to go forth. And they do go forth. God wants us to understand. As he, the judgments went forth from chapter 6 on. Another thing we've got to realize in Joel, chapter 2, Blow you the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the earth tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, it's nigh at hand. It's warning, it's calling everybody. This day of the Lord's coming, it's warning everybody of what's going to happen. He comes down to verse 12 and he says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. They were supposed to turn their heart unto the Lord and give it to them. Rend your heart, not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God. He's gracious, merciful, slow to anger, great kindness, and repents him of the evil. Otherwise he won't bring the judgments upon you if you get yourself right. Who knoweth he'll return and repent, leave a blessing behind him, meat offering or drink offering unto the Lord your God. Then he says it again, blow the trumpet in Zion and sanctify a fast and call a solemn assembly, calling them to get themselves right. Well, what do we see is going to happen? We come down to verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former reign, this is the teacher reign, for righteousness. This is the word for righteousness. We put the cursor over the word moderately. It means righteousness. We pointed this out in the past, but we'll point it out again. 157 times this word is used. 128 times translated righteousness, justice, right, righteous acts. All the time, except for one time, moderately, it doesn't make any sense at all. 
and this is this refers to the teacher reign, the teacher for righteousness, as Young's brings out, and he'll cause to come down to you for, for the shower, this rain, the former rain, this latter rain, and it really means in the beginning, not in the first particularly, but at the beginning as he brings forth. Otherwise, what's this tell you? That means that the teaching is going to come forth for the ripening of the crops, which is all of us, for maturity, come to the place so we'll be ready for the end time outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is going to come forth. What's going to happen is we get this word coming into us, this double portion rain. We're going to be fruitful. The floor shall be full of wheat, the fats will overflow with wine and oil. Those are all the fruitfulness of their crops. They're going to be overflowing. They're going to be full of it. That means great fruitfulness. I'll restore to you the years the locust has eaten, the canker worm, caterpillar, palmer worm, great army I sent among you. Otherwise, all the judgments that came against them because of all their sin and the destruction, God's going to bring restoration. He will restore us from curses and judgments that have come. You're going to eat in plenty and be satisfied. Praise the name of the Lord your God who's dealt wondrously with you. God's blessings are going to be coming upon us. My people shall never be ashamed. Well, we're not going to be ashamed because the reason you're not ashamed is because the enemy doesn't triumph over you anymore. You walk in the ways of the Lord. You'll know I'm in the midst of Israel. That means God has manifested himself now in the midst of us. That I am the Lord your God and none else. You're not going to have any other gods before you. You're putting him first place and living unto him only. And my people shall never be ashamed. And then he says it'll come to pass afterward. That means all these other things precede that. Which is what? Getting your heart right, being sanctified, being holy, being taught righteousness, fruitfulness, restoration in your life, blessings coming upon you, God in your midst, uh, no other gods, conquering all your enemies, not being ashamed. When he, this has all happened and we have come to that place, just like we've seen in the other verses, then what? I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, I'll pour out my spirit. This is the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The glory of God is going to manifest in the end time church. He also says, I'll show wonders. This means signs in the heavens and the earth. And then when it talks about blood, fire, and pillars of smoke, this is referring to the judgments that are coming because the judgments are going to be poured out. We see these judgments coming and we'll even, where it says the blood, fire, and pillars of smoke because they're going to be poured out in Revelation. We see Revelation 8, 7, the first angel sounded, followed hail, fire, mingled with blood, cast into the earth, third part of the trees burn up, all the green grass was burn up. Second angel sounds, a great mountain burning with fire, cast in the sea, and third part of the sea becomes blood. All these signs, the blood, the fire, all these things happening. We see the same thing happening with those two witnesses. If anybody tries to deal with them, remember, uh, they're going to try to get after them, but they're, they're not going to get anywhere. If any man will to hurt them, the two witnesses, Fire proceeds out of their mouth, devours their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. And they have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. <laughs> uh, these, all these things are going to happen. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. It's going to be quite a time. Revelation 9. Here's the angel sounding with the key to the bottomless pit, and what's he going to do? He opens the bottomless pit, and arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, this is all this smoke of the pit, which is this, this pillars. Pillars, of, if smoke comes out of the pit, it's like pillars of smoke coming out of it. These are all speaking of the judgments that are going to happen. Judgments are going to be happening but the, who, well, the ones who are walking in the ways of the Lord, they're going to be okay. Because he comes down here and he says, It'll come to pass whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. We're going to be delivered. And in Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said. 
and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Or, this really means is calling, because this is a participle active mood, which means ongoing action, like the present tense in the Greek, in whom the Lord is calling. He's calling us. And we're going to respond to the call, then we're going to be chosen, because we're going to obey the things. And we're going to be delivered. The remnant, those are the ones that are going to respond. Everybody's supposed to respond, but unfortunately, only some will respond, unfortunately. He's going to manifest himself. Look what it says over in Psalms. Many things that we see about the trumpets. The judgment, the warning of the judgment is coming. Psalms, that is. Psalms 98. Verse 6. With trumpets and the sound of cornet make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof of the world, they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness, he shall judge the world and the people with equity or uprightness. The judgment is coming, it is going to come. We also see, as these judgments are coming, as we already pointed out before, but we'll just kind of review this one point we brought up. Exodus 19. Remember what's happening. The Lord said to Moses, go to the people, sanctify them two days, today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. That's the church age, what you and I are supposed to do. Be ready against the third day when the Lord is going to come down and show up. Well, we see that was happening. And he said, be ready against the third day. And here in the third day, in the morning, that's the early part, there were thunders and lightnings. What's coming first? The judgments are going to be poured out. They're going to be poured out on, on all these, these the people in the world that have rejected him. A thick cloud upon the mount. After these judgments have been poured out over those three and a half years, what's going to happen? A thick cloud. He's going to come in clouds, isn't he? And the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so all the people in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. We're going to meet with him. We're going to meet him in the, in the air. Jesus. And so the meeting comes. And then it talks about, here he descended on fire, the smoke, as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole place quakes greatly. And the voice of the trumpet sounded. Otherwise, this speaks again of the judgments when he's manifesting. And here the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder. And Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down from Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. The Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Well, that's going to be Jesus who comes back and catches up the church, and we all go up. We all go up to heaven, and we're going to be with him. Praise God. Show you one other thing. It's out of Joshua for you to understand what's coming and understand this great work that's going to be accomplished. In Joshua chapter 6, Joshua was the place they were going to destroy. We come to verse 3. And they were going to destroy this place, which is a type of the destruction of all of these nations on earth because of their evil. You shall compass the city, all you men of war, and go round about the city once, and you're going to do it six days. What's the six days? Remember, a day is a thousand years. That's the six thousand years. So, met, the men have been here for six thousand years. That's what it's talking about. Seven priests will bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. Here's the ram's horns. This is the jubilee. The jubilee, which is liberty. The seventh day you compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow of the trumpets. They're going to blow these trumpets on this seventh day. The seven trumpets are going to sound on the seventh day. It'll come to pass when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, and you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shout with a great shout. The wall of the city will fall, fall down flat. The people shall ascend up. And we're going up. Every man straight before him. We're going to go up. And it's interesting. 
We come to verse 10 and look at something. This is speaking back in time of what Joshua had commanded them to do before they came to that seventh day. Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then shall you shout. In other words, for the six days they kept going around there, they couldn't shout or say a word. Why? Because for 6,000 years, Satan had control because of the lease that had been given into his hands, and man could do nothing about it. That's why he could say nothing. He couldn't do anything about it. But when the seventh day comes, ah, that lease is up. Now something can be done about it. That's why these guys had to be quiet until that time. Verse 14, the second day they come to the city once and returned to the camp. They did it the six days, as we see. Came to pass on the seventh day, they rose early, about the dawning of the day, compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they compassed the city seven times. Came to pass the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets. He said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Ah, this is the retaking of the earth. And what's going to happen to him too? Here it talks about how the judgments are going to come. The city shall be accursed, even in all that are therein. They're all going to get wiped out, except for Rahab the harlot shall live, which is going to be the ones who are all type of those that are right with God, which is going to be the church that's going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. They're going to be brought out, while the rest of the place is going to be destroyed. And that's exactly what happened. We come down to verse 20. People shouted with the priests, blew the trumpets, came to pass. The people heard the sound of the trumpet. The pe pe people shouted with a great shout. The wall fell down flat. People went up in the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city and utterly destroyed all that was in the city. Both man, woman, young, and old ox, sheep, ass with the edge of the sword. That's all a type of the destruction that's going to come upon the nations that have rejected Jesus. It's after the six days because it can't happen before the end of that time because of the lease that was given unto man. The judgment is coming on the nations. We'll look at these other scriptures that we looked at just to refresh your memory. Of course, what's going to happen for the church? Having met the conditions and being ready for the Lord, the good news is going to happen. The Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's all the ones that are dead, that are up in heaven. They're going to get their glorified bodies. And we which are alive and remain, remain also can mean to survive, because the ones that survive are the holy righteous ones shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the catching up of the church. We see it spoken of over in 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. This is one of the mysteries, the translation of the saints. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised and corruptible, and we shall be changed. <clears throat> this is the mystery. We're going to be getting a glorified body. And it's interesting, as it says in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, that's the last trump, the mystery of God shall be finished. Well, that would include the mystery of God of the translation of the saints we just read, as he's declared to the servants, the prophets. And we see further what also happens, because Jesus has taken back the authority and the control on the earth. Here's the sub angel sounding also in chapter 11, verse 15. There were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world. Eh, that the devil had control of for all, all along, 6,000 years are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Jesus is now going to be ruling and reigning. Praise God. The kingdoms of the world are finished. They're done. 
when this is the seventh angel, seventh one. We see in Revelation 20, as we mentioned, the dead in Christ rising and us caught up to meet the Lord tells us the timing. The dead in Christ rising is the first resurrection. That's a resurrection, isn't it? Well, here's the first resurrection. This is the first resurrection. At that time, the rest of the dead don't live again. They stay dead for a thousand years during the millennial reign. Who's in this company in the first resurrection? I saw thrones, the throne seats, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Otherwise, they're, so they're going to be ready for their rule and reign in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. This is all the ones that were up in heaven that had died in the past. And what else did he see? There's other ones that are up in heaven that he saw. The souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. Uh, these guys had been martyred, but now what about them? They lived. Well, that means they're in this same company because they, got, they were dead in Christ and came back with them, and now they live. That means they're now alive with brand new bodies as well and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But why is this important? Because this tells you the timing and who all is in the first resurrection company. It's those that not only that had died in Christ before, but also those who came through the tribulation period, telling you when is it the first resurrection. It's at the end of the tribulation. At the time of the fulfillment, after the three and a half years, the first the Feast of Trumpets fulfillment, the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. And we see this declared over in Mark, chapter 13, verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, that doesn't mean before, that means after the tribulation, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light, Stars of heaven shall fall, powers in the heaven shall be shaken. That's going to be because of Jesus coming and the great brightness of the glory of God manifest. They'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds, clouds with great power and glory. What's going to happen? Then he shall send his angels. And what are they going to do? They're going to gather together his elect, the chosen ones, from where? From the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth. That's all the ones that are alive on earth to the othermost part of heaven, all the people that have died in Christ that are coming from heaven. So again, that's the dead in Christ, and that's the ones that are alive on earth, that are alive and remain. They're going to be caught up to meet, they're going to be gathered together. And when is this? That's after the tribulation. Again, showing that. And the good news is that God will keep us and protect us. Remember John 17, verse 15 that we've seen before. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. The time will come when Jesus comes to take us all out from the world. When we get brand new bodies, that's our redemption drawing nigh to get a, the last part of redemption. It hasn't been completed yet. It's not, there's a one more aspect of it, which is the glorified body, the brand new body where death is finished. Praise God. And we have a glorified body living forever with him. Praise God. Praise God for this great work. It's going to happen in the end time church. We see many things. The church is going to come to perfection. We see the warnings. We see they've got to deal with their sin. We see the fact that we've got to be watchmen to warn others. We see the fact that, that everybody's got to come to the place of, of conquering their enemies and, and walking in the way that we become one. We walk in the ways of the Lord and, and we see the building of God in our life. We come to the place being hearers and doers. We've got the foundation laid. We grow up in all things. And when we see everything happen, the glory of God manifests, remember, the glorious church that is going to be presented unto him. And we'll conclude with this last scripture. What kind of a church is presented to him? This is what you and I will be to be presented to him. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. God does the work in us as we hear and do his word, and he will accomplish that great work.
Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation of what happens in the church come, leading up to the end of the church age and what will happen with the judgments coming leading up to the Feast of Trumpets fulfillment by Jesus Christ when he comes to catch us up to meet us in the air we meet him in the air and we get a glorified body and we are with the Lord I thank you I will make sure that I see the work of God done that I become a part of the glorious church I'll be righteous and holy no spot or wrinkle no blemish I thank you for the glory of God that will be manifest as in me as a part of the end time church because I'm a doer of the word and I thank you I will have the presence of God and what's in me will be the word only and I will see the fruitfulness and God accomplish everything in my life thank you I will see this accomplished because I'll be a hearer and a doer of the word and I will be presented a part of the glorious church and get my glorified body thank you Jesus for your, what you're going to accomplish in my life as I continue to hear and do the Word of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God for the great work. Let him have his way. All you want's the Word in you, you know. Get rid of all this other garbage. Total restoration. Total, you're a total sacrifice unto God. Just think of all those things. That's what he's going to accomplish in your life. You're living unto him totally. Praise God for this great work. Father, thank you for all that you accomplished as we're hearers and doers of the word. We praise you for this being accomplished in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.